It's almost as packed as that panel with Gene Kim and Adrian Crockford, right? I mean, it's about the same level. Um, today I'm going to be talking about OpenShift, Kubernetes, and Docker. There will be live code being shown. This is not just slideware, but I need to get through a little bit of slideware just to get everybody on the same page, all right? Uh, this is the Steve Zero, because I'm leet like that. That's all the places you can find me. Any ingress players? No? Oh. Okay. Well, anyway, if you ever do play ingress, that is who I am on ingress. The agenda, cover the tech, show some demos, wrap it up. Seem good? We can handle that? Yeah. Assumptions. You have written a web application once in your life. Is that a good assumption? It could be back, not even Perl with like CGI bin or anything like that, not way back. You've interacted with a web application at one point in your life. Okay. Keep lowering the bar. You've turned on a computer. There. And you like things easy. And I think this one is actually, by a lot of companies, is actually ignored. Easy trumps almost everything else all the time. If you can make something easy. So if you like things easy, we'll show some of that. So platform as a service, how many have heard of platform as a service? Three, four, most everybody? I, I can't, OK, this is like the, the roll, every ethic stadium with like the rolling wave due to cross. So I'm going to go through this quickly then, since it seems like most people know what it is. Yellow is managed by the provider. Blue is what you bring to the table. Infrastructure as a service, and we just heard all that talk about OpenStack. That's infrastructure as a service. You bring everything except for the networking, storage, and CPU. right? So if you like being a sysadmin, infrastructure as a service is for you. If you just want to write applications, infrastructure as a service is really sucky for you. right? So if you like writing applications, you also don't want to do software as a service because you don't get to do anything with software as a service, right? You just consume it. So that's still sucky for you. So platform as a service is in the middle. Everything except for your application is managed by the provider. And that's what a platform as a service does, okay? So I'm going to show OpenShift. I'm just going to do a quick level set. Everything I'm showing is OpenShift origin. That's, we're Red Hat, so what does that mean all of our projects are? Open source, exactly. So all of our work goes into OpenShift Origin. We have a new version coming out in 14 days and some number of hours. I was just watching the ticker going. And that's what I'm going to be demoing today. We had written a PaaS before, and it did use containers and everything else. But in that time, since we've written it, Docker and Kubernetes and all these other great things came out. And so our new version takes advantage of that. We host OpenShift, ah, uh, forget it. We, that, is that enough propaganda? Does everybody get know that we're Red Hat, it's OpenShift, it's a PaaS, and it's open source? Everything I'm going to be running today is, I guess I should use the laser clicker. Everything I'm going to be running today, if it were, no, I'm not going to use the laser clicker. Everything I'm going to be running today is OpenShift origin in a vagrant box on my machine, OK? So let's start from the bottom, containers. How many of you have heard of Docker? Everybody's heard of Docker, so, and everybody understands containers? Yeah, OK. OK, so the reason why we went with containers, this is why we chose containers as our new technology. It gives us good application portability. It's very easy to create and work with derivative images. You know, that has that almost like Git where you can layer images together. It's fast boot compared to a VM. We were using containers before, so that wasn't a huge advantage to us. But the, pro the, the problems with it is it's a host-centric solution. Right? There's no, you can't go across machines. It's all contained within one machine. There's no higher level provisioning, so there's no, although Docker, the, commun the company, is working on that. And then there's also no usage tracking or reporting. Right? So it's a good solution maybe on a developer's desktop at this point until more mature stuff is put around it. So for us, as Red Hat and OpenShift, it's efficient resource usage. It makes it much easier for our bring your own bit story. Right? We had a cartridge, which was like a Docker container before. But it was custom to us, and so everybody had to do this extra work. So now we say, just bring your Docker container. So there we go, and it's a huge ecosystem. So big win for us. All right, Kubernetes. I'm sure people have heard of Kubernetes, because unless you're under, if you know Docker, then you've heard of Kubernetes. How many people have actually used or understand Kubernetes? Kartik, you don't get to raise your hand since you work with me. Anybody else? No. OK, so I'll go a bit slower on this one. How's that? Kubernetes, it's a system for managing containerized applications across multiple hosts. That's from the website. From. Now here's one of the big differences. It's a declarative model. And so what does a declarative model mean? It means you tell Kubernetes, the world should look like this. 
and then all the nodes check in and make the world that way. There is a single place of truth, which is the etcd server inside of Kubernetes, and everything makes itself match up to the, sa the sense of truth. Okay, which is a different model than a lot of the passes out today, which is you tell the main server something, and then it goes and tells the other servers, go make this thing. Here, if anything ever happens to something out somewhere else, it's very easy for the server to know what it should look like because it just says, oh, etcd has the truth. I'm going to make myself look like that. Okay? And it's an open source project by Google. In Red Hat fashion as well, we are one of the, of the top 20 contributors to uh, Kubernetes. We, are the top, we have four in the top 20, right? So we do everything upstream. There is no like, oh, we're going to make a fork and then we're going to do our own version or we're going to put our own extensions on it. Everything that we thought that we needed for OpenShift in Kubernetes is being put in by our team. Same thing with Docker. So the concept in Kubernetes, a pod. A pod is a co-located group of contain Docker containers that share an IP and storage volumes. Right, so what might be an example of pod one where there's two containers in it? That might be a, J, a Java EE app server and a cron job. Or a database and a cron job. Right, it's things that you want to be able to see the same disk and that should share an IP address. You would not, if you're writing a web application, you would not have that being an app server and a database in the same one. Right, because as soon as you do that, then they're tied together and then it causes all sorts of scaling problems and you don't get any of the benefits of running like this. So a pod is things that need to be co-located but don't really need to be right next, but, but that you want to scale, you don't need to scale independently. Does everybody get that part? Okay. A service provides a single stable name for a set of pods and acts as a load balancer. So in the bottom one, you can see we have a service called web that's talking to two different pods each of which are running a JBoss container. When you're at talking to those JBoss containers, you would actually come in through the service. The service acts as a layer of insulation for the pods. These individual IPs could change, and as long as you were talking to the service, you would still be getting to the JBoss pods underneath. So a service is actually kind of like a load balancer within the platform as a service. Does everybody understand that concept? Pretty much? This actually, it turns out, services actually don't even have to point to anything inside Kubernetes. They could actually point to an Oracle instance off somewhere else. It's just an endpoint that you are using to broker to other things. It's, and it's independent of that other thing, so you can swap that thing behind it as much as you want, and none of the other services have to know, right? A replication controller, it lives at a... I say this metaphorically, it lives at about the same level as the service, it lives right above a pod, and what a replication controller does is it manages the life cycle of the pod and ensures the specified numbers are running. So in this replication controller, you say, I want three replicas. That means I want three pods going. If one of those pods dies for a reason, the replication controller is the object that's going to say, oh, I need to spin up another pod again. The world doesn't match what the truth should be, so I need to make it match. So that's handled by the replication controller. Oops, I think I skipped one. No, I didn't. So the wins, oh, we get now runtime and operational management of containers. We can manage related Docker containers as a unit rather than having all these disparate ones sitting around all over the place. We get these pods. We get communication across hosts now, right? Availability and scalability through automated deployment and monitoring of pods and the replicas across host. So this manages your suite of all your containers running. That's basically what do, uh, Kubernetes does. Does everybody get that? We're good. Any questions? I, am I allowed to take questions even though it's a keynote? Any questions? I don't want people getting lost. It's a big keynote. You can tell the attendance is packed. The light show is amazing. No questions? We're all good? Okay. Um, by the way, it also includes software-defined networking. And we bring software-defined networking, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So OpenShift, it's basically a division of labor. Google came to us and said, hey, we're doing this Kubernetes thing. Do you want to be part of it? And we said, sure, as long as you make it all open source, and then you're not going to go all the way up the stack like we are, so that we can each have our own little world that we go in, right? And so they provide, Kubernetes provides the container runtime, and we do all the nice stuff on top for ops and devs that makes it a nicer platform to consume, right? So OpenShift, there's some concepts that come from us, which is an application 
That is your entire suite of everything together. The config basically says how everything's matched together. It's a concrete file that basic, or a JSON or YAML specification that says this is how everything's connected with everything set in it. You can actually make that into a template. So like the database username and the database password could actually be some random number generator that you specify in the template. And when you turn that template into a config, it generates the username and password. So the template allows your group to say, oh, this is how we always stand up MySQL with PHP for our application. But it doesn't specify the exact username and password every time. Each person who spends it up gets a different version. And the build config says, when I do a build, what GitHub repo am I looking at? What we've also brought with this new version of OpenShift is you can actually do a build config based on image changes. Right? So we'll track Docker, a Docker repository, a Docker hub, and if someone actually changed the Docker image, we'll actually rebuild the entire project as well. So you can do that whole dev workflow against source code, but you can also do it against a Docker image, your, your container iterations. And a deployment, that's how you, what, how you deploy everything, right? So if you were to build it all yourself, that's kind of how it looks. There's a I hope you're memorizing this entire chart. There'll be a quiz at the end. Actually, this will just be in the slides later if you kind of want to get an idea of what's going on. Again, here's, again, the light, where is it projecting from? Oh, it's, is it a TV screen? Where's it projecting? Oh, from behind. I was like, where's my finger? I keep moving and I don't see it. The, there's the etcd server in the middle, right? And that stores the, the truth. And then in, here's the node, which is where everything, no laser pointer. Here's the node in which everything runs. And here's the master, which coordinates the stuff and which our API talks to. OK? So it's time for a demo. Was that enough slide where? Does anybody have any questions on the slides? Because basically, that's it in terms of concepts. Yeah. Exactly. See how fast that dog does that compared to that person? They're like struggling. I saw you say, oh shit. Yeah, pretty good, huh? I'm not going to do that though. All right, so the demo is on this machine. And you've already switched. All right. So I have spun up. Here's, I'm running this all in Vagrant. It's running in VirtualBox. If you want a copy of this, this is the open source version. I can get, give me your details and I can send it to you. It's about four gigs in size because it has a lot of stuff already built into it. It's not that big if you don't want the stuff I put in there. So I'm gonna, we have a command line tool and I'm gonna log in. So I'm gonna talk from my, lap, this is me on my laptop talking to that Vagrant image as if it was a, an OpenShift server running somewhere out there in the world. Does that make sense? I'm not actually SSH'd into my Vagrant, my virtual box, okay? So I'm gonna log in. Can anybody guess what the password is? It's pretty secure password. We take security very seriously. Okay, so now we're in. We're gonna make a project. So a project is where you put everything together. This will hold all your services, right? And it keeps them in one area and then a team can decide who works in that and who doesn't work on it. So we're gonna call it Cisco Rocks. And now we've created that project on the OpenShift server and we can start creating things inside of it. So, I'm gonna show you, I have a script just so you don't watch me put in typos. You're welcome to read the script, I'm not hiding anything in my script. What I'm gonna do right now, is I'm gonna do this command. And what this is gonna do, is this is, is that big enough for everybody in the back? I need someone that's like over 40 in the back. Okay, good, thank you. I noticed after 40 my eyes went down very rapidly. So what I'm gonna do with this one is I'm saying I'm making a new application. I keep telling the developers new, the new app command should just be called magic. So what new app does is it looks at the thing you're passing it and tries it to make a best guess. And so since I'm passing it a Docker image, that's the Fedora Apache Docker image, it's gonna say, oh, you, you wanna run this Docker image, don't you? And so it's going to make a pod, it's gonna make a replication controller, and it's gonna make, uh, I think, an uh, image stream, which is what holds the, keeps track of the image. And so what it's doing right now, hopefully, there, it's done. So we have just, it's just told etcd, make the world like this. And now, if I do osc get pods dash dash watch, it looks terrible. So let's go over to the web interface. Does everybody remember the password? 
So there's Cisco Rocks, there's our project. It's already running. So that pod, that application is now already running. See it right down here? There's our deployment. Notice that there's no, UR, there's no URL name or anything, it's just a, po an, a pod that's running. And it's got a service in front of it. Here's all the information about the service. This is the part we care about. So inside of OpenShift by default, we're using OpenVSwitch to do software-defined networking. We have plugins if you have other SDN solutions you want to plug in, but by default, we're using OpenVSwitch. So let's copy that. Now, if I, I want to go to this one. They, oh, that, should I make it bigger? Is that good? Bald guy, is good? Okay, two bald guys right in a row, that's awesome. Coming from the, ha the guy with lots of hair. Um, Vagrant SSH. So I'm going to SSH actually into my OpenShift instance. For some reason, when I made this Vagrant image, it didn't capture the password. Guess what the password is for that, too? Vagrant. Good. Okay, so we're in, and now I can do this. Right? Remember back here, it said the IP address for this is, and it's on port 80. So I'm just going to say, well, let me take a look at that. That's what the Apache, the Fedora Apache uh, Docker container spits out by default. When you hit it on port 80, it says Apache. Okay, so there it is. We're inside the container, we can see it through that internal. Internal. The other thing we could do, although I'm not going to show it because we don't have enough time, is if I then go to the the pod. There's the replication controller. Let's browse pods. You'll notice this has a different IP. It has. It has a different IP address, right? And you never want to go to that IP address directly, right? Because that IP address can change. That's why we go to the service, because the service will always point to any pod that comes up with the label of Apache on it, right? That's why you want to use a service, not that direct IP. If you need to for some reason, you can, do, you can but it's discouraged. And this is a Kubernetes thing, not an OpenShift thing. All this stuff that I'm the, the part that I just showed right there. Okay, so but now you say, well, that's not very much fun. I actually want to see that on a web page, right? So what you have to do is define a route. By default, by default, services are not exposed to the outside world because we assume you might want to stand up a database and you don't want that to the outside world. Or you may even want to stand up a REST service that you're only going to consume with inside of your project, right? So we don't define them by default. OpenShift built the object called a route, and we're going to make a new route. And so this is how you make a new route. I'll copy it from here, and I'll go back to the command line, and I'll go back here. And so basically what we're saying is expose the service named Apache at this host name, right? It is exposed by a host name. There. So we've now made a route. And so what this means is, if I come here, and I say, the host, in the, I'm going to insert the host header into the web request. Does everybody know what that means? Or does most people know what that means? So there's headers in each HTTP request. By default, it usually is the same host as what you're requesting, right? So if you go to CNN, the host header is going to be CNN.com. I'm not running a DNS server on my machine. That is not some kind of pain I want to The reason why I use a platform as a service, because when I do that sysadmin stuff, bad things happen. So what I'm doing here is I'm, when I make this request to localhost, it's going to insert the host header and say, yeah, we're actually, the host is, Cisco.com. So I'm going to show you the new Cisco homepage after this show. That's going to be after this show. It's a big rollout. You guys can say you saw it first. There it is. Pretty exciting, huh? This is why they pay me the big bucks. So that was the exact same thing we curled before. But now what's happening is I'm actually going in to the Vagrant. And I'm going into the server and pulling back instead of having to SSH in. Right, so route says show this to the outside world with this host header. Eventually we'll be adding it so you can specify an IP for something like a database connection if you're that foolish. Okay? 
So the next thing I want to show, I already showed you the web console and the pieces. I'm going to actually spin up, the, remember I talked about templates. So what I'm going to show you now, let's actually open it. This is a big, long template. And you're going to all, I'm going to walk through each and every piece of it. And you guys are all going to talk to me about it. No. What, I'm going to sh what this template actually does is it spins up a Ruby application, it spins up a container that's going to run Ruby. And we're going to have a Rails application running inside, or no, Sinatra application running inside. And it's going to spin up MySQL. And it's going to connect the two together. And it's going to make a route to it. OK? And the, the source repo is actually going to be against my GitHub repo. So while well, that's spinning up, because it's going to take a while to clone the Git repo, and it's going to be available at www.steve.com. And if I think, I think, let me find, that was a bad thing to search for. I'm looking for replicas. There's my Git repo. Let me just search on replica. So replicas too. Remember how I say the replication controller specifies how many should go come up in the world? So what's going to happen here is there's going to be two replication, two pods for the Ruby front end, because I'm specifying it here. So to use this, you're going to miss the best part. Sad. That guy's going to go home and be sad for weeks that he missed this part of the talk. So here we go. So what this is saying is process that, remember I said templates can have random values they generate inside of them? So I process that template to make the password and the username and all that stuff. And then I pass that into create. Tell create, hey, here's the actual template all filled in. Now go create that thing. Here's the config. Go create that thing. All those things are go ongoing now. So if I go back to my web UI, right, and I'm in Cisco Rocks. But this is way too, there we go. That's no fun. The builds failed. Let's try it one more time. That's going to complain now. Ugh. So they both failed. Nice. Let me just quickly see if I can rescue this. Otherwise, I'm going to give up, and I'll just talk to you a little bit about it. It promised it worked like a half hour ago. I don't, here we go. So let's see if it works this time. We can go back to the web interface. So it's running. So that's actually now, that's trying that build again. The database came up. Does everybody see that part right there? So the database is already spun up. We've run into a problem here. And we'll see if it works this time. What it's actually grabbing, it's grabbing This source code from my repo as part of the build process, bringing it down, doing what we call STI, uh, source to image build. We have this, Docker build has some, we think Docker build has some problems. It's pretty specific. And we actually have a more generic mechanism called source to image. So what we're doing is running this inside of the pass to build a new Docker container and then de deploying that once the build is finished. Okay, so that's the code we're actually running. And I want to actually change this to show you a build actually happening. But let's see if it worked. It's still running. That's good, I think. What was I going to talk to while this was going on? Oh, you know what? Actually, we can actually change the source code right now.
So we're going to actually change hello from OpenShift to hello from Cisco. And it's been updated. So I can actually, if this is finished, has the build finished? I don't know if it's ever going to finish. It was steve.com, right? It's not up yet. So imagine, if you will, though, when that build was finished, I would have, you know how I called get build to get kick it off again? I could make that source change right in GitHub and call get build again, and it would, oh. It still doesn't have a pod though, so it built a new Docker image and now it's going to actually have to deploy the new Docker image. There we go. Thank you for keeping nodding your head to keep me honest with what's happening on the screen. So we should see two pods, right? It did that by default. Do you want me to, which would you rather see, me do a new build or me scale those up to three? Because we're almost out of time given that the moderator, but there's nobody else after me, so you guys are all here till, my flight on United was delayed, so we're here till seven. Nobody gets up. Do you guys want to see, a, I'm going to raise the hands again. See the build happen again, which was kind of slow and not so fun to watch, or watch that scale automatically up to three. Scale to three? Okay, scale to three has it. This is how hard it is to scale it up to three. OSC, scale, replicas equals three, the replication controller is front end one. So I'm basically saying, hey, front end one, make the number of three, the, rep, the replicas three. Scale. So now if I go back to the web UI, there it is. It's already done. Right? Because what it had done in, already is it already, I keep pointing like this because I keep expecting there to be a shadow. It's not fair. Um, what it had done is it already cached that Docker container. Right, so all it's doing right here is taking that exact same Docker container and spinning it up. So that's, that's what containers get you. See how fast that spun up? Right, and I can scale this back down to two. Guess what I do to make it scale back down to two? Change this number to two. And there it is. Right? If you want to see the app now, it should actually be up. No, I did something wrong. Was it Steve? I thought it was steve.com, but I must have done something wrong. Oh, I know why. We terminated, do you remember there was that big binary hex thing inside the template file? Of course you all remembered it because you memorized the file, right? So everybody nods yes, thank you. So we actually defined an, a TLS endpoint for that. So this needs to be... There. So that's our app. And it's running. So now you guys don't get to see the other build. If you want to see it, I can run it while everybody's walking. But can we switch back? Thank you. So wins. We get to efficiently manage thousands of applications, scaling components independently and updating them en masse. Responsive, change-aware platform supports fault-tolerant, automated, and repeatable builds and deployments. All the tech packaged up and made easier to use. So this is one of the other things we say. If you want to, the easiest way to install Kubernetes is actually to install OpenShift, because it sets it all up for you and runs it. So conclusion, we covered a lot. For us, meaning Red Hat, it's the Linux story all over again. Huge community through the, our bed up, upstream. As opposed to other PaaS vendors, we're betting upstream rather than some sort of fork of different groups. So come build with us. We love pull requests. Your world is a system inner developer is looking bright. Use containers to have an agreed upon way. This is one of the big wins, right? You can use the same Docker image on your local machine that you actually use on the server. So it's easy for everybody to agree. And then we can automate some annoying things, template an entire application, the infrastructure and code, and it packages all this technology into one nice package. So sorry for the propaganda bits, but I think that was that a halfway decent demo. Everybody kind of enjoyed the demo rather than just slides. Thanks. Great. And Stephen, um, do a wonderful job. Let's see if we have a couple of quick questions from the audience. Have any questions for Stephen? 
Can you switch back to the demo? I'm going to actually do the build again while you guys are asking questions, because I'm a glutton like that. Any questions for Steven? All right, well, he's going to go back to the demo. I'm going to continue on. We're going to play a little bit of background music. You can come on up and speak to him if you'd like. We are officially